Hi, this is Paula from CHE. We have a complete recording of the December 2020 Municipal Council meeting. You will be able to watch it in a few moments, but first, I wanted to give you the highlights for our area north of Inverness County. Council discussed some residents' requests to close the Cancel Causeway. People from across Cape Breton Island have expressed concerns about COVID-19 outbreaks in other parts of the province, and so the causeway is closure as a possible safety precaution. Since the decision belongs to the provincial government, Council can only make recommendations. At the latest meeting, councillors decided not to push for the closure, but to let the province make the call. Another highlight, this one specifically for Shetty Camp. A public meeting about changes to the Cabron zoning bylaw, which was expected to take place in December, will be pushed to January. Council said it needs to look into a safe way for people to participate, and that means the meeting cannot take place at the local school. Council will speak with John Bain, director of the Eastern District Planning Commission, about ways to consult the community. Councillors also heard an update about the province's internet service expansion plan. The first round of projects is expected to be rolled out during the first semester of 2021, between March and May. And that includes Shetty Camp, Granitain, Point Cross, Capstick, Cape North, Mid Cove, Bay St. Lawrence, and South Harbour. Pleasant Bay has been announced to be in the second round of projects, but a time frame for the area isn't available for now. That's it for our highlights. Now here's the complete recording of this month's council meeting. I'm going to call the meeting in order at 1.30. Uh, before I go further, we would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the land which we are gathered on today is located in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I was just informed, I should have known about this, but I was informed by the Deputy Warden that today is International Day of Dis people, Persons with Disabilities. So. And I should have known about that, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, so the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Anybody have any requests or additions? I'll, I'll go over a couple I have in case you were thinking of them. Under business arising, we have bylaw 30, which we just did, but we have to do another reading. Um, we have discussion regarding the public meeting for the bylaw with um, in Shetty Camp. Um, and I want to talk just briefly about the issue around closing the causeway that's been around in the media and stuff and get your guys' thoughts on that as well. Um, and uh, so, so there's that. And then there's one on um, the we had a, a, an idea for a sort of a gift to the, through our discretionary funds, which we'll discuss, for the hospital auxiliary. And we'll, I'll just put, you can put that down as hospital auxiliary. Anybody? And then we have in-camera items as well, but we'll deal with them when we get there. We also have some guests here today from Judy Group, and we'll be introducing them um, a little bit later in our agenda, but welcome, folks. Um, so, approval, Any anything else on the agenda? If I, if not, can I have a motion to have the agenda approved as amended? I approve. Moved by Deputy Warden McIsaac, second by... George McLennan. Uh, Councillor McLennan. Need further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Approval of minutes. So we have two sets of minutes there, and we'll do the um, October 12th, 2020 minutes. Um, is there any errors of missions? Sorry, did I say? You yeah, November, October. Right. October. Sorry, it's okay. I'm a month behind. That's okay. I just thought oh. I'd correct you now. Thank you. <laughs> Um, that was regular council, November 12, 2020. You should have a copy of them, have a chance to look at them. Mm -hmm. Any error submissions? Any, someone want to make a motion to approve? I'll make a motion, John McLennan. I'll second by, it. Moved by Councillor McLennan, seconded by, by Councillor Chisholm. Any further discussion? Question, all in favor, aye. 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 
Opposed? Motion carries. Second set of minutes is Committee of the Whole. That was our last meeting, November 19, 2020. Are there any errors or omissions there? No one done. If someone want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. They be adopted as read or presented. Moved by Deputy Ward McKaysey to accept the minutes of November the 19th. Yeah. Committee of the Whole. Seconder. I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Gillis. Any further discussion on the motion? Question? All in favor, aye. aye. This oh, the little button on the side will shut that right off. We thought we did it. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, present, okay, the business arising. Before I go into the items that I mentioned there, um, <coughs> does anybody else have any other business arising from that that's not on the agenda? No? Okay. Um, I will start off with the public meeting that was going to happen in um, the 17th in Chetty Camp, and maybe our CAO could speak to that. Sure, after our last council meeting, um, staff went to uh, find potential locations in the community of Chetty Camp to host the meeting um, and maintain social distancing at the same time. Uh, we were unable to find a facility that was uh, available for that date that had accessibility uh, plus enough room to house at least 40 individuals and with the increased uh, number of COVID cases and, and stricter uh, social distancing rules, um, we're bringing this back to council to, uh, to discuss and, and uh, see if there's an agreement to move that public hearing back to uh, January uh, 2021 while we are then able to ensure we have an accessible uh, facility available and uh, we should have greater knowledge of where uh, things lie with COVID-19 uh, in terms of a potential second wave uh, at that time as well. Any questions or discussions? I might add that I warned that uh, the, f the meeting, the first meeting, when the meeting that we had was at the school on auditorium, and I think it was given permission, not by the right management, and that's why we had that meeting there, and I don't think we should have got it there, so, and that's why this time it was, uh, Refused. It, was, different story. it was a different story. We have about 350 people that you can go there, but you know yourself, schools, and, you yeah. know, you, you can get in, so that's part of the reason. Yeah. So, any other thoughts or ideas? I know the, the bylaw change was going to put a moratorium on any new development. Um, I think if a new development between now and January was to pop up at Papa's head, we would still take a serious look at with John Bain as to the appropriateness Well, I that. tell you what, the warden, if, if there's no uh, bylaw pass, I don't see any reason why any permit would not be given because whoever do apply for it, uh, if we go and we're going to change without having a special motion on it or anything like this, yes. we are, we're wide open. Yeah. Because, you know, if I was to put a campground in Shetty Camp right now, and I would start working and, you know, and then I could have all my uh, decks in line for January the 6th or something like this, I don't, I don't think you, council would uh, stop me. And I don't think it will stop anybody else either if they want to do it. You yeah. Know. Until we have the bylaw in effect, yeah. there's nothing that we can do and we can control. And even John Bain, because it goes according yeah. to the bylaw. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why can't why can't we have a meeting in Shady Cam and just have it on mostly all written submissions? 
instead of uh, I think there's rules 40 around, people there. Yeah, but I think there's rules around what a public meeting would nice. entail. She, the, the, it would be up to John Bain, I'm hearing that. So, I mean, we could consult with him. And yeah, well, like, yeah, we should consult with him, just have written submissions and somebody read them off, most of them off, or have three people read. If there's 30 submissions, See, another, three people. Que another question on this. You know, we had a reading today, basically there was nobody here. Right. So there might not be nobody in Shedigam. But at the same time, you know, I hear both sides of that bylaw. So I don't know if you're going to ask me how many people is going to be there. There could be about maybe 20, 25. There was probably and, 40 the last time when you Yeah. Started. And then if the other side comes in, we only had one side. Yeah. So you if the other side comes eight. in, you might end up with 80 or 100 people. You know, when the there are arguments or something like right. this. That's when you get the people in, and that's why it is tricky to have it, you know, in a small avenue. Right. And that's where COVID cuts in. That right. says you can't have that many people. Yeah, right. but that's all you can do is say due to the COVID idea or agenda or whatever, <coughs> we're only allowed 30 people in. <coughs> Council or whoever, maybe 10 people from one side, five people from each side do. Yeah. Give their submissions. Or, or could you could you have people come in by appointment and make the presentation <coughs> without being in you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There might be a group or two or three want to come and you schedule them throughout that period that want to make but, a presentation. Uh, but most of the submissions are going to be the same anyway. Yeah. You know, ones that don't want the part, right. they're going to say <coughs> the same as Five people would say, and the ones that want it, they're going to be the same idea. So I can't see why we just can't get a meeting going and have, if the building, or what, there's a percentage you use, if it holds 100, you're only allowed 50 or 25, and that's it. So currently with the, the agendas for the public hearings, it does ask for both written submission and public. So, right? Uh, we would have to ask for more clarity from EDPC because they are the hosts for, for that session. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly right now, we, we would have to make available the ability for people to present in a public manner. Right. Uh, but Councillor McLennan has some um, possible options there that we can bring to uh, Tom Bain in terms of can people register, can it be staggered, or uh, we, there might be the option to do it remotely as well. Uh, but we'd have to reach out to EDPC for more clarity on that, on that for sure. Yeah. I think it would like reaching out to them and asking them, yeah. you know, for more clarity. Is give us some direction that's of where we go. And it's all yeah. just due to the COVID. It's a well, different, it is. different than two, yeah. two years ago. Just yeah. people, people know what's going on and you don't have to explain to them. This is how it's going to go and that's it. Yeah. But check with John Blaine. John Blaine would have know yeah. exactly what the rules are around there, yeah. and we'd have That's to follow good. that. Perfect. So, is everybody comfortable with yeah. yes. something Absolutely. with him first? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Keith, you take that on. Okay. So, my agenda here. Um, so we got that done. Um, causeway closure. Everybody's seen and heard that one on the news. Mm -hmm. I got a call from our deputy warden. Was it last week? Last week. Yeah. yeah. Who had heard a rumor that there was a public <coughs> meeting coming up that night um, regarding discussing closing the causeway, causeway due to COVID. I, called, I hadn't heard a thing about it. There was nothing coming out in email. I checked with staff here. They have heard had heard nothing about it. So I talked to the mayor, Brenda Chisholm Beaton in Port Hawkesbury who had talked to uh, the new mayor in Port Hawkesbury, Amanda McDougall, and I believe maybe a couple others, but... Um, the new mayor in Sydney. Sydney, Sydney, yeah. Sydney yeah. yeah. What did I say? You said Port Hawkesbury. That's Locked okay. The new mayor in Sydney, yeah. yeah. Um, the long story short was there may have been a meeting at noon that day between a couple of them, but she wasn't even sure of that. She had told them she couldn't attend. 
and I believe the warden from Victoria County couldn't attend. So there was never, as far as I'm understanding, a full gathering of all the wardens and mayors to discuss this right. issue mm -hmm. on this side of the causeway. And then you have the other side of the causeway is just as important as well, and those people have concerns. Yeah, definitely. And they, 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 people cross that causeway for work and medical appointments and everything every day of the week by the hundreds. Mm -hmm. People come over to work at the pulp mill. People come from these, our county in Port Oxbury go to, to, for example, may work at the hospital in any condition. I'm just using those as examples, and there's lots more. So uh, the mayor of Port Oxbury and I had a really good 45-minute conversation around the pros and cons, and both of us kind of felt that it was a big step to try to take and recommend. And all we could do was recommend. The, the Premier and Dr. Strang have the total say in how that would go. We don't have any power to make that happen. Um, I know the mayor was talking about if we were going to close, we'd almost have to do the eastern zone. How do you cut the eastern zone in half just because there's a causeway there? And we also talked about the fact that there's no <coughs> cases on Cape Breton Island. That does not mean we couldn't be flooded with them tomorrow. Um, but so far, so good, and we hope we could keep our fingers crossed and keep it there. So at this point in time, both her and I felt that it probably wasn't the way to go, so we didn't give it much more support. But I wanted to bring it back to council, explain the conversations, and maybe there's other opinions on that as well. Mr. Warren, I would say, so far, Nova Scotia and the Atlantic provinces have been very good with COVID-19. I think if we're going to be honest, Dr. Strand and Premier McNeil have been on the ball all along. And we have a medical group across Cape Island. I don't think the mayor of both city, the town and the city of Sydney and even ourselves should have anything to do or say what is, uh, what is happening about COVID-19. We have special people, special, special, specialized people, doctors, continuously working with it, with the Dr. Strand office, and I don't think that our council and the other council and Sydney should get involved with it at all in Plain words, it's none of our business at this And we're already getting directive. Pardon? Well, our directive is coming from. Comes regularly from. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. think it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. 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 I, I do. Yeah. It's just. I didn't lend it any support at all. <laughs> I can tell no, you. That. No, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, if I was going to support it, I wouldn't do that with him. Yeah. No, right. Exactly. 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 But and I, and I mean, I that's, that's, that's just my opinion, you know? Yeah. No, I agree. I, it totally. And I watched Steve Murphy ask the Premier the same day that Amanda McDougall, right. the Mayor, had made that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and he said, what do you think about this idea of Premier, he, Premier you know, he just kind of chuckled and said, it, it's better for them to uh, have, encourage their people to wear their masks and keep their distance. That's right. Which not, is not exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> right. yeah, and don't exactly. kind of help back show up. That's right. Yeah. Or, you know, or vice versa. versa. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think our people are well educated on that. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And to do that would just disrupt so many more oh, lives. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Right. Yeah. Unless it was absolutely good. So is everybody we're comfortable with that? We don't have to help. spend a lot of time on yeah. it. No. 100%. No. No. Exactly. I just yeah. want to make sure you're all aware yeah. of my discussions there. Okay. Um, there is probably meeting. Bylaw number 30. We might as well do that one again. Um, this is our second reading, bylaw number 30, capital cost of water and sewer. Are there any written presentations? No, it wasn't an hour ago. Are there any verbal presentations? Anybody out there that wanted to speak to it? Any further discussion by council? No. So. Need a rec we need a motion to approve. Second reading. Okay. Second reading. And is that approved? Once we approve second reading, that automatically puts it in place. Yeah. Okay. So we need um, a motion to approve second reading of bylaw 
All those Third. about the second reading take place. Warden, <coughs> second. I'll second that motion. Second by Council McClendon. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, one more item. Um, Councillor um, Chisholm contacted me earlier in the week and she may have sent it to the I'm not sure, about the Inverness um, exi Hospital Auxiliary. Um, they are in a bit of a situation this year whereby they can't do their normal tea and sale, which raises huge dollars. Um, for the hospital, and and we also have we should think we also have a hospital in Chitty Camp. If we go ahead with that, we should make sure we cover both. Um, but the idea was possibly for each counselor to put a small bit of their discretionary funds together, and we make a presentation to the hospital auxiliary, and we could do. Is there a hospital auxiliary in Chitty Camp? Yep. Yeah, so we, we, we can't do one without the other. No, no, very strong. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're very strong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and both of these organizations, what they do for the hospitals and what we have there is hugely a result of the hard work of the volunteers and the auxiliary and the money they raise, and it all goes back into the hospital. So, and I know we fund the hospital, but um, I thought this might be a nice way of us saying Merry Christmas to everybody yeah, absolutely. And, and doing that. Now, I'll ask Tanya, what are the restrictions we have, if any, around that? Or, or Keith? Very, uh, very few. You just have to check and see if you have any of the other. Yeah, we, we do. do. Yeah. We do, yeah. <coughs> we all have enough discretion, more oh, than enough discretion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. Do they don't have to make an application, do they? Yes. They do have to make an application. Oh, really? Do they? <laughs> really? We just can't. Uh, so they have to go through the same process as any other organization. Okay. Melanie Beaton. Yes. Yeah. Melanie. Hi. Yes, so generally our process is that all nonprofits apply for funding have to complete an application uh, to the municipality. Uh, that way you're able to ensure that you're treating all organizations equitably. Um, the piece about the hospital in particular, uh, you could consider it as discretionary funds, uh, but this could also be a case um, of consideration for regional uh, funds because it is more of a regional asset versus <coughs> um, one community. And, and so that's another consideration that if it did come in via application, uh, we and, and staff reviewed it, it's likely that the recommendation would be to also consider as a potential funding avenue regional funds. Okay. So they have to make an application for uh, Council, you, you ultimately make the decision, but uh, generally all applications so that you can treat them equitably uh, have to come in via application. Yeah. Okay, we'll go Once by we, application. Yeah. How can we streamline that application as much as possible? It, it's a relatively uh, straightforward application, um, and uh, we can certainly send the application along. Uh, they do have to provide us with a copy of their latest financial statement oh, and uh, some a, a little bit of detail regarding their um, the organization itself. Um, and how the funds are used, um, and then they do uh, have to report on how those funds are used uh, to council uh, when that's complete. I think the Inverness Auxiliary <coughs> uh, sent an application. Is that a letter? A letter. Yes. A letter. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'm just gonna. Does she need to go further with that one? Yeah. That's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Heard it. Just, I, didn't. I, I just asked Debbie, I believe the, the Inverness Auxiliary has already um, sent um, a letter to, to Debbie, but I'm asking now, does, does that have to go further with this application? Uh, so 
My answer would be yes to this because we've had cases before and the problem is where do you draw the line when applications, I understand that this is a regional um, asset and that um, it's not hard to make a case to give, but where do you draw the line when you start walking away from the policy or protocol that ad is in place right now in that you expect less from some organizations uh, than you do from others. So in order to treat them fairly uh, and equitably across the board uh, and to align with the policy as it exists at the moment, uh, my answer would be yes, they should complete an application. Uh, and that application would be reviewed at the committee of the whole, so long as it's received in time, um, the next committee of the whole meeting. Would it? Uh, sorry, Councillor yeah, yeah, Okay. Uh, well, if there's anybody leaving here, there should be a paper trail. Yeah. And I think uh, we should have an application put in. And another thing, too, is like, for example, let's say we have the Shedekam Auxiliary or the Inverness Auxiliary. Like, for example, Shedekam, for a while, they were raising money for an extra machine, which, uh, you know, they, and they might have fifty, sixty thousand dollars in the account. So I come in with their financial report and show sixty, seventy thousand dollars. But at the same time, it's there for a cause or right. something like this. And I think so, if they just put that, it's earmarked for. That's right. That so as long as and, they ju justify that. That's you know, fine. and uh, another question <laughs> is, how much money are they going to ask for? You know, if it is, is there a need? If there's a need, okay, but and do we give it to them just because they're doing a great job? Because we have a lot of volunteer uh, groups that are doing uh, uh, good jobs, and uh, you know, I'm not. I'm I not get a, it. They can't, and they I'm can't have a, their sales either. I guess that's right. Yeah. You know, I'm not yeah. against your, uh, no, no, I'm your, uh, you know, <laughs> your, your issue. But uh, at the same time, I think you know, like. Uh, we're looking after the, people, the people's money, yeah. and I think it would be a good idea to the paper trail. We, we need, we need. You yeah, know, I think paper. we all agree with that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Yeah. It, it also allows you to compare the same information that you collect from every organization, so that yeah. you are able. You could, if we don't do that, we're gonna. It's gonna come back to bite us every time. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, what I was just a thought I had here is if we had a counselor volunteer in Shetty Camp should obviously be Alfred, um, and maybe one of the counselors, Deputy Warden or Lynn, um, to go just meet with, take the application, mm -hmm. sit down with that hospital auxiliary person, and just fill it out and get it back to the office. Then that saves them a lot of trying to figure mm -hmm. all this out and be with experience for new counselors too. I can do it. Yeah, for sure. Are, are you prepared no, to do that no. too? So, and I was thinking in the in the around five hundred dollars each or something like that, not a huge, but maybe what? I sorry, uh, counselors probably shouldn't complete uh, a community grant application in partnership uh, with an organization because they're ultimately asking you for funding uh, to allocate that funding. But that's what staff is able to do. So you can direct staff to meet with. Um, organizations in those communities. It's just to avoid any conflict of interest. Um, that would just be my suggestion. Um, that the ask likely shouldn't uh, come from a counselor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I'm just so trying to make it as easy for the. Meetings, but they yeah. shouldn't fill out the application. Right. I'm trying to make it relatively easy for the volunteer out there that has to go through this process at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, but that's staff can be directed to okay. do that. Yeah. Do we want it? Are we comfortable with that? Absolutely. Yep. And no. what's the amount of funding we're talking here just to give a ballpark? Or, I mean, they can ask for whatever they want, but do they work specific in their in their uh, No. It's, it's a donation. It's, Yeah, but it, so there is no ask other than the donation. Are you directing staff? Yeah, do we want to direct staff to address it? Address the Absolutely. address the amount we're talking. We're not talking ten thousand dollars each year. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm throwing out five hundred each, but we can 
can go higher or lower. That's up to you guys. So you're talking about 500 from each one of us? No, no, no. And the I'm talking 500 for each of the hospital? Yeah, oh. which would be a little less than 200 each. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a, a good number for sure. Or, or we could do 200 each would be 1,200. So. And that would give each hospital 600. So I'll go 200. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. So is that okay? Each is that okay? Fund. We'll live. So there's no application has been received. So I would wait until an application is received. Okay. They put an ask yeah. forward. They could yeah. put an ask that exceeds what you're discussing right now. Um, and, and then we make that determination. And then you make that determination, and the recommendation would come forward with how it could be allocated. So potentially, if it was over what um, was asked, it could be consideration under regional funds, or maybe it does fit within discretionary. But I, I certainly uh, would. Just based on the fact that you have uh, agreed to uphold policy and ensure that an application comes forward, uh, the application will state the uh, and, and ask for an okay. Uh, all right. Okay. So you'll be looking after that, will you, Melanie? You'll be I getting will. the most so, okay uh, person. So we're giving. Do you want a motion to that effect? Would you? Uh, a motion. No. It no. would just be a recommendation. Recommendation. That, uh, recommendation. that staff is directed to follow up. I don't want to make that recommendation. I'll make the recommendation. That's it. That goes. For staff to contact these? Con yes, for staff to contact the two organizations and have that discussion around so, um, how they may make application and that uh, we're supportive of their organizations and, and uh, counsel them through that process. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is a presentation from the Judy Internet Committee. And maybe if each, I, I can't see who all is out there. Can each one of you stand up, maybe, and introduce yourself? Uh, my name's uh, Bill Murphy. This is uh, in the corner is uh, Flo Campbell, uh, Marina McEckler, and uh, John McInnes. And three of our committee are not here. That's uh, Vern McDougall. Sarah Rankin and uh, Kenzie Kevin. Okay, welcome. And I, I just want to advise that our, our presentation is at the end of the 15 minutes. So uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, everyone, uh, today we're going to focus on just the next steps going forward on the internet. A lot of funding has come into the county, and a lot of good things are happening. And I think we're pretty well aligned on what's going to happen. So we're just going to go through a set of suggested steps and see if that fits good with what the county is planning. So again, the, uh, the group that did this, a lot of this work over the last year is the uh, team that came out of both C. Judic and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Port Hood model, uh, Better Internet for Internet, Internet County. So what we did a lot in the last year was engage pretty well every decision-making level relative to this project from federal ministers down to councilors. A lot was developed in Nova Scotia. We created a lot of powerful materials and messaging that was heavily placed on Facebook to get uh, the community's attention and also the attention of Bell Canada and things like that to keep pressure on them. And we did a lot of community engagement to reach out to the other uh, development associations, answer anyone's questions, to bring together a focus on the need for a change in the internet. Next slide. So as I mentioned up front, what we're really here for today is to make sure uh, to highlight what we think are the options going forward and to see if we're aligned with what the county, particularly what Keith and the team, are thinking to go forward. So that's our main focus today. Uh, we're going to take some questions at the end, but uh, we're not here today to explain a lot of the details of the internet. Some of that can be quite complex and we have a short amount of time, so we're focusing on what we think needs to be done. Next slide. So, the big thing is on the internet. So the most important thing that needs to happen now, and Keith will comment on the end, but I'm pretty certain Keith is working heavily on this right now, is the developed Nova Scotia and Bell are planning their rollout. They have what's called a fiber map. You want to identify what communities are not being covered by the present fiber map and exactly what roads are going to be uh, covered. Because a citizen needs to know, is the fiber going down my road and can I connect to it? So the fiber app is a, is a critical piece. You have to get the fiber app. A map, that's the first thing. The next thing is, there will probably still be some gaps. Develop Nova Scotia on their website still has more money. Once you know the gaps, 
you can ask them to provide more money to cover those gaps. So that's another thing that needs to happen. As soon as you find a gap, go after more money. The next thing is, there's a new federal government fund called the Universal Broadband Fund, and I think Melanie might have been looking into this. So anyhow, the first round for their shovel-ready projects closes very soon, January 15th. We, or the county, or Bell, or Develop Nova Scotia can all apply for money for that to also <coughs> extend the fiber net. So that's a second source of funding with a very short time. Both of those sources of funding, the Universal Broadband from the federal government, and a developed Nova Scotia funds, they can also be used to accelerate the rollout. That means getting more crews on the road to pull the fiber faster. Because everyone knows right now it could be two and with delays three years before some people get their internet essentially fixed. So that's the second thing. You need to talk to those people about acceleration. Once you begin to get it in place, so it's coming in place now in Inverness, uh, very soon they'll start to have it in place in, Inver uh, in, uh, in Shetekamp, what you need to do then is, you need to be able to monitor to see what price and what for, for services are being charged in uh, the Halifax area, Pictou County, and Inverness County. The reason is, Bell will tend to charge more where they have no competition. They have no competition essentially in Inverness County. <coughs> They'll compete against the county in Pictou, and in Halifax they have many competitors. And we can provide you with information on how to easily do that monitoring because the only people who control the pricing are CRTC. So the only hammer you have on Bell to say the prices are unfair is strong public response and um, public pressure. You have no legal recourse to get them to, to change the prices. The next thing is Keith's team right now, and I know Keith has, has meetings with Develop Nova Scotia and Bell, so that's, that's excellent. So what we would like to see happen is that that becomes a regular thing going forward so that Keith always has a path and the county always has a path to discuss with Bell and develop Nova Scotia what's going to happen about towers, what's going to happen about fiber, what's going to happen about uh, service, uh, service costs, anything. And again, we'd like that perhaps to be whoever within the county owns a day-to-day -day work on that. So right now perhaps it's Melanie. And then we're also recommending that the, the county acquire the services of a skilled uh, consultant because a lot of this is highly complex and Bell is extremely good at uh, moving the cups on a table to make everything appear quite good. So, so, and then once you get this done, we would like to make sure those updates become public. So that's the key thing on that one. So, also I'll let you know there's a handout for this and below all these slides you'll see more notes written for your explanation, so you'll see those as well too. The next thing is on cell. So on the cell service, it's important to understand they're not separate. It's kind of like a long, the long road and there's cars and trucks. The cars and trucks are cell and internet. The road is the same. So for example, uh, Develop Nova Scotia, uh, the cell service is totally controlled by Bell. Develop Nova Scotia has no, cell, no say on that. They will only place a tower where their return on investment is three to five years. So the first thing you need to know if you're going to plan some more towers to get have better coverage in the county is where is Bell going to put their towers? So you need the fiber map. I believe all cell companies have to give the municipality the fiber map of where they're placing the towers. Once you know where the towers are going, then you have two paths you can go. The first path is you can work with Bell to extend, to find money to place towers where Bell is not going to place towers, very cooperatively. The second route you can go is, you can actually overbuild Bell, where you may cover the areas where Bell didn't want to go for three to five year return on investment, but the county may want to place a tower right next to the big golf courses in Inverness, because you can rent radios to Rogers, Eastlink, and you can actually make money on the tower. One thing the county has is lots of property you can place a tower on and they can all be managed by third parties so the county has nothing to do. Okay, and the county has a tender on wireless, so again, this may impact that somewhat. And again, we're laying out what we think we, 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 could happen. We're interested to see what, in the end, Keith and, and Melanie and the team feel should happen to see if those suggestions align with what they're planning. Next slide, please. There's another option called Starlink. So Starlink is a satellite which goes very fast uh, by uh, Elon Musk company, they will be offering service next year. 
Now, why that's important to us is we have no competitor to Bell in this county. If Starlink would offer service in this county, that would be a competitor against Bell, very good. And Starlink service can turn up next summer. So rather than wait two years for your service to turn up on the internet, with Starlink, you can turn up right away. So I believe Keith is talking to Starlink, so is Alan McMaster. So Starlink is positive about working with the, with the, uh, on this project. And again, what this would mean is an application to that federal universal broadband fund before January 15th for money that people could use to buy terminals to put on their houses for satellite dishes. And the whole reason you do this is it's faster and it's a competitor against Bell. There's almost no cost for the county for this route, but uh, this is a, a lower priority. If Keith's team feels that this is going to go forward, you might need to discuss it more. If they don't, it's just informational more than anything else. Next slide. So hire a consultant. As I mentioned, these projects are very complex. Complex fiscal issues, technological issues, project management, regulatory, and legal aspects. Um, I-Valley is a company presented to some of the older counselors might remember them. They have expertise on that. I'd assume the consultant who helped you put together a wireless tender, they have a, that person or, would have expertise on that. And I can give you a list of people. The cost to engage a consultant wouldn't be too high because they're not designed on a network or anything. They just need to be available to join you in the Bell meetings. And when you want to ask them a question, can we do this, can we not do this? So that would give you a really sharp person to help on that area. Next slide. So next steps. So what we want to do is we want to understand if uh, what you guys are planning to do and see if that aligns, so our suggestions align with what you guys are doing as a, as a summary of what to do next. So um, then what we'd like to do is we'd like you guys to tell the community what it is you're going to do. What is the plan for internet and cell going today and going forward on, on the different areas you presented. And if we can provide any help, we're happy to do so. So that's kind of like the summary, and we're here now to take any questions you might have on that. Uh, Keith, you, you want to comment a bit? You've been working a lot on this. Well, uh, team, we've distributed the information from Develop Nova Scotia on the phase one rollout and the phase two rollout of uh, their broadband initiative. And in addition, um, uh, the most recent extension to the phase two. Uh, so numerous new communities throughout Inverness County were announced through that extension of phase two. Uh, the coverage area looks very substantial, but as outlined in the presentation, we don't have the detailed map, so we can't say every street is covered or every road is covered at this time. Um, as outlined, the municipal staff, we are keeping up to date. We do get monthly updates from Bell Alliant, uh, and we can certainly ramp that up to, uh, uh, to more of those on, on occasion. And as outlined as well, staff are tracking all of those uh, open applications and have had uh, just as recent as yesterday meetings with uh, MP Kellaway staff to get additional uh, information and background on those programs, the deadlines, um, and the intricacies around the applications. The applications are online, but it doesn't, it's very high level, uh, so we're hoping to drill down and get, uh, get some additional information while we're working to uh, submit an application on the behalf of the municipality. Um, so this community group has certainly uh, assisted uh, other community groups in the municipality step up and and raise concern that their particular community wasn't covered in phase the first announced portion of phase two uh, through develop nova scotia but uh, many of those have been uh, identified and outlined in the extension of phase two but again we have to figure out exactly where those uh, uh, boundaries lie and we suspect we'll have uh, additional information from the De development of Scotia and Bell Alliant in the in the near term of where exactly their their fiber builds are being designed. Uh, from phase one, the Inverness project is complete. Uh, the map that was provided to council outlining uh, the the project in the community of Inverness, phase one, is now fully in place, uh, and the schedule for completion of the Shetty Camp initiative through phase one should be at the tail end of January or 
into February 2021 as complete. Um, we don't have a schedule of how they're going to roll out phase two, but we'll be asking for that certainly. Um, so there's been a lot of movement on this file of late, and this this group is certainly uh, uh, assisted in raising the concerns of residents throughout the uh, county in terms of uh, broadband and uh, service in particular. So there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but we've made some some clear steps uh, just of late. So. I would like to uh, give a special thanks to the previous council because uh, where we are at today, three years ago, we were far from where we are now. You know, we are trying, we have moved, and uh, we have the Shetty Camp, we have Inverness, there's a new plan coming in, and it does cost a lot of money. We have to realize that. And at the same time, I, uh, you know, it is, the plan is great and everything, but uh, you know, and I agree with you 100%, but I think we have to look at the county as a whole, because when it comes to the self-service, I have Pleasant Bay residents that don't have self-service. We have people that died over the mountain. We had an accident that happened about uh, six, three months ago, or five months, give or take. And uh, it's going to cost a lot of money to put that uh, system in for sales service. And I mean, we need more than the municipality to move forward. We need Parks Canada. We need the federal government. And we need, uh, and, I, and I tell you, the reason I'm saying this is that, you know, Parks Canada <coughs> and the cabin trade, and I, uh, I uh, say it with pride, that uh, I think we have the best side of the cabin trail because every time you see Cape Breton, the, the zigzag is always there. So we're promoting money and uh, you know and everything. And I think the people of Pleasant Bay uh, should be looked into the plan. And uh, as we move along, warden and uh, CAO and councillors, that uh, you know we're all on it together, and we should make sure that we don't leave anybody else behind. Uh -huh. oh. um, just to be clear that one of the differences now is that there's money. There's federal money, there's provincial money, which did not exist three to four years ago. And our group has helped and worked with you, Pete, and other people in the county to make sure that everybody's well aware of the funding that's out there and how you access it. And secondly, I'd like to say that we are pushing for all of Inverness County. Mm -hmm. We are hooking up all of Inverness County. I live in Judy. I do not have cell service, so I'm just as interested in cell service as you are. But our goal is to unite the county, because that's, that's how we're going to get progress, is when we work on this together. So I think that's one of the things we wanted to make clear today, I think. We're here pushing for Inverness County because we believe in it. And that money, it does have a shelf life. It's going to go if we don't take advantage of it before the deadline. And that's what I think our, our push is today, Bill. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Uh, the warden and I agree with it. You know, we got to stay, we got to get connected all around. So. Yeah. If I could ask, just ask a question. Where is Craig Nish fitting in now? Is that being looked after in the next phase? Do I answer I think it is. I think yes, I know the answer. It's been confirmed that uh, phase two, phase two, phase two, phase two. <laughs> The second portion of phase, phase two, two, the expansion phase of phase two, two is uh, Craig Nish and, and Craig Moore in that area is confirmed to be covered. I, I asked that question just to educate everybody because that was a major concern when I attended the meeting. Yes. That's, that, that's good news for your area. Yes, sir. Right. So she answered one, but she didn't answer the rest. Somebody has a question? Craig Nish and Glendale are very upset, though. They're very happy that they're on the list, but they're not going to get it until 2023, and that's a real concern. Uh, the rollout where Jody and the rest of the, the county is supposed to get it in round two is supposed to be 2022, the summer of 2023. So that is a big push that we need the county to do to see that 
this roll of it's a lot quicker uh, than the dates that were given. Even 2022 was too far away. We got people who are suffering, who can't study at home, who can't get medical attention at home. All of these things, they need to happen. They need to happen now. We, we really need to push developed Nova Scotia to, to, to push better. Uh, it's not it's not as a fight, it's to help. I mean, mm. they've got money. We need to hope or push that we can get some in this county. You know, I know everybody would be in the same boat, but this is the county that we're we're concerned with. So on the money, you can you, you can get money as you mentioned in your presentation to put more fiber in place, <coughs> or you can get money to put more crews on the ground to pull the fiber faster. That's the, so the answer to get service faster is is more crews to pull fiber, or apply to Starling, buy 6,000 Starling terminals, and I think Bell will all of a sudden accelerate much quickly, much more quickly when they realize they have a real competitor. That's the other other, other way to fix that problem. Because right now, we're in a situation where there's no competitor really to Bell for the future in this county. So that's it. Any more questions? Any questions? I just want to thank your group and your kindness to me at your meetings and informing me of all of this stuff because uh, I didn't have a clue about any of it. And Marina's cinnamon rolls were pretty good too. Um, but the efforts that you made bringing those communities together, that was incredible. And now all of these little communities in Craignish and between Craignish, Port Hastings, Craignish, or uh, Judic, um, all of those are working together and um, we'll ensure that the council is behind this and Work is very good. And thank Creating you so a huge awareness yes. was yeah. one of the big things. And that he's team now is driving forward and all this. I think we're looking at this, get this sorted out. And I stress that monitoring part. If not, you're going to realize in two years you're paying a lot more in health taxes mm -hmm. or victims if you don't put that monitoring part in place. Just so, uh, on behalf of council, thank you for coming in today and sharing all your good information. I too want to say I see. I'm reading a lot of emails from you guys lately, and I see you're conversing with the people in Marguerite and, and the Development Association there, and uh, that's great because I, I come from that community as well, and there's a lot of gaps both in, in internet and, and cell service. None of it exists pretty well except the basics, and uh, I've got a top-of-the-end phone here, but when I drive past Marguerite Forks towards home, I might as well shut it off except I, I can get Wi-Fi connection, but there's very little through that whole area, and uh, it's something we're certainly striving for, but that's joining all the, in the same unpleasant bay, like Councillor Poirier stated as well, and I'm sure we could talk about yeah. many other small areas. Yeah. So, thank you, and oh, uh, we'll, we'll oh, continue Lord. to work together oh, on this. Thanks a lot for Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'll let our CAO, Councillor Keith McDonald, um, discuss the next one about council meetings during COVID. It's something we need to think about a little bit. The staff have been. So council has been following the uh, what we're following in Nova Scotia. This essentially this uh, started the second wave with uh, COVID-19. Um, there's been day-to-day uh, -day advancements of, uh, of new cases announced. Uh, even today, I think there is another ten or eleven. Seven, or eleven. Eleven. And then, so that's causing some concern in the in the greater community. Uh, already discussed by the warden in terms of uh, some items that have come up with the causeway. Just uh, opening the floor to council to discuss their uh, what they think about re reverting back to uh, to uh, uh, remote uh, meetings or continue to uh, have open public meetings and just looking for some direction around that. Um, there's been a discussion through the Administrators um, Association of Nova Scotia, and there are still a number of councils that have not come back from uh, having um, 
um, remote meetings, uh, such as the town of Roxbury, I'm fairly certain. Uh, they just uh, just came back once for their uh, swearing in, uh, but they're, they're maintaining uh, their uh, uh, remote process currently. And some are looking at that to revert back to it that have come out just like this municipal unit. So uh, at this time, we just thought it would be uh, helpful to get some direction and some comment from uh, council on where they'd like to see see that go. We want to wait for more cases to appear uh, in or announced in the Cape Breton area or, or how they want that addressed. So I'll go around the table here to start with, with uh, Councillor Gillis. What's your thoughts? I'm okay with how we're doing it now, but once there are cases, I think we have to be considered if there, if there are cases in the Cape Breton or Eastern region, we have to be considered. I, I feel the same. I think we're, we're doing okay presently, and uh, unless there are more cases, of course, we naturally have to follow that. So, I'm good. Councillor McClellan? I'm okay with having meetings in Port Hood here. Okay. Maddie, you wait. Either <laughs> or, no problem. Yeah. I'm fine too for now, but if yep. the cases continue to climb, I think it's, it would be our responsibility to. Maybe look it up by after, sample, right? Maybe you look know. it up after the holidays. You yeah, know, the new year. Exactly. I think what's happening with that. Just to answer that, I, I think we keep vigilant on it on a weekly basis. Yeah. If staff start or we start here, yeah. and okay. cases moving this way, then oh, we take. We, and you know, the couple of good things are, our staff are all set up to go back to the way we had to do it before, and I think they did an excellent job. It took an awful lot of organization at the time on their behalf. But that organization is mostly intact, I would assume, and from what I hear. And um, so we could go back to that without the disruption that seemed before. And it was really good coming in today when I get in and I put my mask on and come through the door and Danetta took my temperature and made sure I did my hands and uh, asked me all the appropriate questions. So I think we got to keep on top of those things. and and do that uh, the way it should be done and keep our six feet distance. And I was just watching around the table, I'm not pointing any fingers, but when we get here and take our masks off and then all of a sudden we're talking to each other, we don't think to put the mask back on, but now we're within six inches of each other. So anyway, just remember if you're gonna get closer to somebody for a conversation, put the mask back on. So. That's all I have. So do we need a recommendation for anything? I think we're fine. We just wanted to have that input. And uh, certainly our CAO and staff and myself will monitor the situation. And if anybody has any concerns, I say safety first. So send me an email or send Keith an email and say, I'm getting concerned here and we'll deal with it. Uh, I, don't, don't hesitate to share your concerns. I just, I would like to kind of clarify something though. We should never assume there is no COVID no, somewhere. It could you be, know, we can't say COVID there's right? no COVID in our don't community. Put this in the paper, we do not could know be, that, yeah, right? It could be so, a dozen cases in the county you, now that we don't know. Approach it as, it's like there. they say, it's next door, right? So just take precautions. No? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Next, next item is, and we should get through some of these long window ones here, but um, next item is the uh, monthly allowance, monthly rental allowance for municipal councillors. And our CAO has done, and staff have done some more research on that, and I'll let them take that. Yes, so just an update from our previous meeting. Uh, in, in your council package, there's a copy of the minutes from uh, a meeting of the policy committee held March 13, 2017, and those minutes show that a motion made uh, regarding the monthly office rentals for councillors. And the minutes read a municipal councillor may wish to retain an accessible office space in their district to support their role and responsibility in serving their constituents and organizations. If the office space is provided through a non for profit organization. The municipality will provide an annual contribution to cover the overhead of the office space. The amount is not to exceed $250 a month, and the amount will be paid quarterly directly to the organization. So that at that time was moved by Council Muster and seconded by Council Cranton, which was carried. 
So in particular, uh, it provides that if a counselor uses an office space that is provided through a not-for-profit organization, then the municipality will make a contribution of no more than the 250 a month uh, as outlined. In other words, this re resolution provides that the rental allowance is only for office space rented through a non-profit organization. If it is considered an expense of a counselor, and if the expense is used, it is included in the counselor expense reports that are reported publicly. So in the 2018 financial year, the budget allowed for expenses in the amount of 18,000 per year in the event counselors should rent an office space through a nonprofit organization. To date, the only counselors who have been using office space provided through a nonprofit organization are counselors in District 2 and 3. And accordingly, in the current budget, this expense has been budgeted to district, Districts 2 and 3. Uh, the budget allowance is to the amount of 3000 each. Uh, these office spaces used by the councillors are provided through, uh, in the past, the Mill Road Social Enterprise and Cranton Road's uh, Community Centers. To be clear, this rental amount is budgeted as an expense and can only be used if the office rental meets the requirements of the motion from where it stemmed, which I just reviewed. It must be provided, and it most definitely has to be provided through a non profit organization. So currently this expense does not form part of the municipality's expense policy though. It is a requirement of the Municipal Government Act that once a new council is sworn in, the expense policy and hospitality policy must be reviewed by council before the January 31st, 2021. Uh, by that time, council must either amend these policies or re-adopt re them as they are. Uh, so this can this expense can be considered in that review process. I can also can encourage council if they want to look into this uh, even deeper. We can get an, a an legal opinion on any changes that they may wish to make to this current policy. So, any questions for Keith? <coughs> any discussion? Council Corey? Yeah, CEO Warren just want to clarify something. When I get my check every two weeks, how much am I getting paid for office supplies? Or is there anything that I'm paid for, like paper, stamps, uh, etc.? You know, is it, you know, because when you get my, you get your pay, you made, uh, I don't know, uh, $3,000 a week and then you you don't know what's the, the bottom line you know all you get is your deduction you know and so my question is I have my office my copier my uh, paper my everything I would like to know how much am I getting paid by the municipality for those papers for those stamps and everything so that I could have really a good look at it and like I said, you know, it was moved by Jim and Laurie and both had offices, you know. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, like I said it before, I have all the tools in my building. I want, I would say, take it, $3,000. I don't want Alfred Poirier or Dollar Store or Hay Poirier Enterprises Limited send it to charity, check made, not to me, to the charity of Shetty Cap, Mead Cove, and Pleasant Bay. You know, why should I have my office open to everybody? And my wife answering the phone, and where's Alfred? Oh, Alfred, he's gone to Port Hood, you know? So I'm, I feel that it's not fair. And I mean, it's up to council to do it. And if they don't want to do it, I will do it publicly because I'm not being treated fair. I, if I took the money personally, yes, I would feel. But I'm talking about fairness and honesty. When I started my first day with you guys, with the new council, and that's what I call fairness and honesty. And if it is not this, it will go publicly. 
and it's going to go publicly right now because there's no if and buts. I feel that uh, I've been doing enough for getting nothing. So uh, there's two items to respond to there. So the first item is that that minutes, well, the motion, as I just read, does not allow for um, rent to be moved along to a nonprofit because it, says, it states in the motion that the amount uh, to be paid quarterly directly to the organization. And it also states that the office space must be an accessible office space with a nonprofit organization. But we can, again, as mentioned, we can, if council would like, get a, a, a further definition on that. Uh, but if not, uh, I want to tell you that uh, by the end of the week, I will call you where I'll be locating my office and uh, where everybody will go. And I get paid like everybody else. And then if there's anything, I want to know how much I'm getting paid for my stamps and all that stuff. Because I don't want, you know, no, no, no. It's going to be honest. I want to be honest with the municipality, but I want to be honest with myself. CFO, do you want to respond to what's in terms of the wage wages value? and what's included there? Uh, I can respond to what's included in your honorarium. No. So prior to 2019, um, one third of your salary was non-taxable, so it was tax exempt, right. and that one third of your salary was intent, the intent around that exception initially was that that would cover the cost of the expenses, office expenses of the council. So when the federal government removed that exemption, we increased the honorarium so that you would not be penalized for taxes. in paying extra taxes. So there's a portion of that honorarium where the intent is that it is to cover some basic office supplies. Uh, what's it also included in your honorarium is $170 a month for you to travel freely within your own district, whether you can go anywhere um, or not. And when you travel outside your district, that would be a part of your expense plan. And we also, you also have in your honorarium uh, $100 a month, so $1,200 annually for, to put towards health benefits. So about health benefits, about the, and that was a motion that was made five, yeah, six I don't, years I don't ago. Yeah. So you do have your base well, salary, yeah. um, then you have your travel within your own district, and then you have the health on top of that. And again, in 2019, council approves that the honorary will be increased. Okay, yeah, I have no problem with that. My question now is to the existing councillors and the new councillors, do you, do we, do we send out any bills for uh, cartridge or papers or uh, nobody is getting paid or never got paid for that uh, as far as the previous council? We have purchased um, sub supplies for councillors and we've taken it off their expenses when we submit their expenses. So if you submit an expense for $300 and we purchase in cartridges because we get a better rate on yeah. them, then we deduct it from your expense tax. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. And uh, I'd just, like just like to make a comment, Councillor Poirier, about yeah. the vote that happened back then where Councillor Muster moved it and I yeah. seconded yeah, yeah. it. It was approved by all councillors. Oh, if yeah, were, If you were in attendance, you would have voted to approve it. Oh, yeah, I approve with it, you so know. I take a little bit but, of exception to the fact oh, that. Oh, no, no, don't take an exception to it, you know. But I'm just trying to get all my things yeah. in, in order, you know, so that uh, I'll be talking fairly and everybody should be treated the same. So yeah. that's where I'm going. Um, any other councillors want to I, I do. I think the $250, depending where you live in the county now, like in Inverness, office rates have any rate uh, rent has gone up, you know, quite exponentially yeah. with, uh, with the golf course and that. So, yeah. you know, although, I think 250 is isn't very much really for a month. Although we said it, it's, it's not to cover the total rental cost, I don't think was the intent. 
it's to cover part of it at least. Well, um, <coughs> that was my feeling around the motion that was made at the time. Um, I could have a $600 a month rent, right. but I don't come in and ask for the other, you know, 450 or 350 or whatever. That's up to me. If I want to rent a, a luxurious, I'm not looking you know, for I don't, luxury. I don't know you, go, you can go look at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but it's yeah. hard to find something. Yeah, for I know where, where where I went from the community center. They wanted three fifty a month, and I said I can't afford to rent it for that. Right. I can give you two fifty a month, and they agreed. Right. Well, so, that's basically what I did. I just yeah. said, well, there's two fifty. So. so. Yeah. Any other discussion or thoughts? Well, with this office space, sir, two fifty. Are the people that are getting this or were getting it, are they in the office eight hours a day? I wouldn't say no. There you go. I know I spent six hours in my office one day being with an individual last yeah, week. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, for five days, I yeah. should say. Yeah. What would mean? You know, that could, to me, eight hours a day consists of a job. And that's what a person should be in your office eight hours a day. We're not paid as counselors for a full-time job. Well, maybe the counselors, we shouldn't be getting the 250 or whatever it is. Because I think, Tanya, didn't you mention the money, some money for that? Absolutely. For, for office space or paper and all that stuff? Did I? Yeah, did, did, I did you? Did, I, sorry. Pardon? I missed the first of your questions. Okay, you were saying there's so, you explained to us there's so much money for oh, whatever. Oh, like the honorarium. Yes. That, that was the original intent of that tax exemption, that that, that would, would, you would recoup your, your office expenses. Yes. Um, but uh, the, the office rent space is a separate, a separate one of the council that was approved. Yes, exactly. So it's up to council if we want to change that or leave it the way it is. The way it is is pretty straightforward, but we do have the option to change that as council if there was a motion and vote to change it that was approved. So Yeah, so as mentioned, there is opportunity to review when we have to, according to the Municipal Government Act, of, uh, to review the expense policy and hospitality policy by uh, January 31st. So. There is opportunity to have further discussion around the whole, both those policies. We have to do a review the expense policy with everybody. So at that time, it would be where we would, if there's someone wants to make a motion to change it, we could entertain it at that time. And But see, if we go at that time and then uh, your office is uh, taken or something like this, you know, like what I mean, whatever you decide, it'll you know, either or, but I don't want to move, you know, my, my, your office, my office to their, uh, to, to another office, you know, for nothing, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a lack of common sense, I would say, but anyway, you know, okay. that's the way I see it, that I would say. Yeah, no, that's the way I see it. If you have an office in your building, and you got your paperwork in there. Come on. At 11 o'clock, they all know at 11 o'clock I'm there if I'm not on the road. So, uh, you know, and I'm always there at 11 o'clock up till 2, 3 o'clock. So, uh, but if I get an office, it'd be basically a few hours here and there, you know, because I go and my wife is working next door at the end of our store and we stay for dinner and people come after dinner, dinner, and, Etc. So I have that office pretty well open every day, except, this, well, not except this morning, but this morning before I left, I did one, one guy came in to fill a form, you know, so, but I mean, whatever you do, you know, it's all up to you. <laughs> but I mean, it's just. It's up to council. Yeah. So anybody, anybody want to make any recommendations or motions now, or do you want to leave it till we discuss our expense policy? It's the choice right now. Let us think about it until yeah. the next meeting. Yeah. Then. Have the other. Mull it over. Who's got an office space? I got an office space. 
I, I'm yeah, just starting days. as of tomorrow. I'm just, I'm just beginning when I start tomorrow. Um, my, my feeling on the space as I became, as I was elected, is that in my house, I don't have the space. Mm -hmm. And professionally, yeah. I believe that I should have space for privacy. And also um, liability. I don't want that responsibility if somebody trips, falls coming into my basement. I do. My husband and I both have an office downstairs, but it's not divided. Right. So no. that is the reason why yeah. I chose to to have a space. Um, I'm not going to be in there, you know, five days. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not going to be in there many hours, but there'll be hours where I will be there. Yeah, right. My, and the space that I use, like in the last two weeks, I filled out three applications for people looking for home improvements through Nova Scotia housing and stuff. Well, they're coming in there confidentially with their tax mm -hmm. bills, yeah. their property bills to put into the application, mm -hmm. discussing their private affairs. Mm -hmm. They, I wouldn't even think of bringing them to the door of my house with two dogs and a parrot. And it's just not yeah. professional yeah. or comfortable. Other people I coming and going all the time, I no, wouldn't do it. Yeah. So yeah. if I didn't have that office space, I would have to go out and rent every time I needed it, mm -hmm. a space to meet. Mm -hmm. And that would be just a continual nightmare. Especially with COVID, if I didn't have the space with COVID, right. I can call you my can own. control your own space. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to meet. So that's yeah. my perspective on it. Absolutely. I'm not looking to get something for nothing for sure. It's it's a uh, it's a necessity. Well, why don't we just look at this when we're reviewing? Yeah. And uh, everybody we'll put it on the agenda. Think about it until planned. Yeah. We're all good in the meantime. Okay. I see I jumped ahead of myself here now yeah. and did the second reading already. Oh. So, Tan Tanya, Tanya, we're, we're good to go there. Okay, so we can move right into recommendations. So just let me get organized here. I have a oh, sheet yes. with, I think uh, we have a sheet there that uh, our great staff have put together with, uh, I'm just going to find mine. Okay, this is it. With, uh, um, does everybody, did everybody get a copy of that? Uh, this one? The one with the places? Yeah, yeah. I can give it to you. Okay, you haven't given it to you. Okay. What we've done is try to give you a little more information. We can't put the people's name or the civic addresses on these until the date of tax sale comes up because um, that way it would be unfair to people to maybe have information about tax sales. What's that? We went to monthly rent and strict community grant applications. Did we miss? Or Second we... reading. We already did that. Okay. The transit? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to think yeah. of the best. And do you want to help us <coughs> a little bit? Well, Leah's throat, maybe? Each, yep. each one needs to be completed as a separate motion. Okay. So we start with 9.1 and basically go right yes. And everyone needs a separate motion. Yes. And we ma remind yourselves that we went through all this the last meeting we as did. well. So unless there's something that's changed, we should be good to go. There's nothing that's changed, but we do need to read the motion. Do need with, and do need to read the statement here too. In as part of that is the motion, right? The motion is. I don't have a copy of the. Yep. Of the yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. So everybody got a copy. Just take a second, and I'm going to get you to read each one yourself, and then we'll ask for a motion to approve it. Then you can read it out when you if you're ready to make that motion. Yeah. I have them in my other package. 9.1. Yeah. Right, 9.1, if everybody's read that. So 9.1 is basically saying that instead of a public auction process, we're going to go to a tender process for the tax sale um, to be held on February 5th. 
So someone want to move that and read that statement? I'll give it a shot. Okay. Uh, read the whole. That do, whole paragraph. Okay. Yeah. That due to the, the COVID-19 COVID-19 pandemic and the current Nova Scotia State of Emergency Municipality calls for tenders for the property rather than put the property up for sale at public auction pursuant to Section 141-2 of the Municipal Government Act and closing date for the tender shall be February 5th, 2021 at 2 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. Thank you, John. Seconder? I'll second. Seconder. Moved by, moved by Councillor McClendon, uh, seconded by Councillor McIsaac. Deputy Board McIsaac. <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, 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 losing it here. Uh, CAO called me, the different name of the lady. There you go. Anyway, um, any further discussion on the motion? No. Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next one short. Who's going to take that one? I'm going to take it. Yeah, and you got to read. You just uh, A A N. Yeah, yeah, start there. A A N zero two eight five two seven four eight Cabot Trail Petty Tank. That A A N zero two eight five two seven four eight be placed for sale by government pursuant to section one four one of the Municipal Government Act. So we have a motion to move it. Second. Double yep, checking. Second by moved by De Deputy Warden McIsaac, except second by Councillor Clendon. Any further discussion on the motion? No. Nope. Question? All in favor aye. 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 Opposed? Next one. Nine point three. I move that A A N zero two eight four five three eight five Waikama Mountain Road. That AAN 02845385 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of 2500 <coughs> Section 141, subsection 2, and Section 141, subsection 3 of the Municipal Government Act. We have a mover, seconder. I'll move. I'll second. Or second, second. whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, moved by Councillor Gillis, seconded by Councillor Chisholm. <coughs> Any further discussion? Question? No. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 9.4. Okay, I move AAN 0196636637 Crandall Road Sugar Camp that AAN 0196636637 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of $400 pursuant, $400 pursuant to Section 1412 and Section 1413 of the Municipal Government Act. Seconder. Oh, second. Second. Moved by Council Chisholm, seconded by Deputy Warren McIsaac. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9.5. Uh, AAN 03855538, Shore Road, Little Judy Ponds. That AAN 03855. Three eight be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of two hundred and fifty dollars, pursuant to sections one forty one dash two and section one forty one dash three of the Municipal Government Act. So moved. Moved by Councilor McClendon, seconded by. I second. Seconded by Councilor Chisholm. Any further discussion? Question. No. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. 9.6. I move that AAN 0572711 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of $5,000 pursuant to the section 1412 and section 1413 of the Municipal Government Act. We have a mover, Councillor Fourier, seconder. Oh, oh. Go Councilor ahead. Gillis. Sure. So moved by Councillor Fourier, second by Councillor Gillis. Um, any further discussion on the motion? Question, all in favor, aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. right. Opposed, the motion carried. The list goes on. 9.67. Don't need to take that one? Yes. You guys <laughs> keep sharing it around. AAN <laughs> 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 0058716 Chiman, would that be correct? 
pronunciation of that. Laurie Road, Shetty Camp, that AAN005871668 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of $1,500 pursuant to sections 141 subsection 2 and section 141 subsection 3 of the Municipal Government Act. Moved by Deputy Warden McKaysey, do I have a second there? Second. Second by Councilor Corey, was it? Yep. Yes. Any further discussion? Sure. sure. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 9.8. I move that AAN 00372412 Ashfield Road Iron Mines, that AAN 00372412 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of $500 pursuant to section 141, subsection 2, and section 141, subsection 3 of the Municipal Act. We have a move. It's moved by Councillor Gillis, second by Councillor McLennan. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 9.9. .9. I move AAN 02676303 Main Street Poor Hood that AAN 02676303 placed for sale by tender and a minimum bid of uh, 7,500 pursuant to sections 1412 and section 1413 of the Municipal Government Act. I'll second it. It's moved by Councillor Chisholm and second by Councillor Gillis. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9.10, I believe. Yeah. Okay, AAN 00152366 Cabotay, Crabot, Cabot Trail, Grand Etang. That AAN 00152366 be placed for sale by tender with a minimum bid of $2,500 pursuant to section 141-2, section 141-3 of the Municipal Government Act. So moved. Seconder. I'll second that. Moved by Councilor McClennan and seconded by Councilor Deputy Warden Geisig. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Opposed? Motion carried. 9.11. I move that the uh, demolition order be issued for the property of 16 and 18 Beaton Street in Venice. Seconder? I'll <coughs> second. Oh, Gillis. Okay. So moved by. Uh, Councillor Poirier and seconded by Councillor Gillis. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9.12. Oh, do you want me to read that? Yeah. Demolition order 3972, Highway 19, Long Point, that a demolition order be issued for this property. So it's moved by Deputy Warren McIsaac, seconder. Seconded by Councillor Chisholm. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Okay, 9.13. Uh, demolition order 15867 Central Avenue, Inverness. I move that a dem demolition order be issued for this property. So it's moved by Councillor Gillis. Second by Deputy Ward McIsaac. Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Okay, what's that, one three? One th 13. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so one four, one, nine point one four. Committee structure, I move committee structure, audit committee, the Deputy Ward McIsaac and Councillor Chisholm participate, Councillor Gillis, participate in the audit committee. Any further discussion? Oh, a seconder? I'll second. Second to mm -hmm. Councillor McClendon. Any further discussion? Question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. We're going to do our committee structures here. Okay. So, who wants to take the next one? I'll take the next one. Committee structure planning and advisory committee that all municipal councillors participate in the planning and advisory committee. So moved. Moved by Deputy. Warren McIsaac, second by Councillor Poirier. Any further discussion? Question all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 
Uh, 9.16. So, John, do you want to? Yeah, we're going to. I was talking to the councillor, give us through the week. <coughs> and the uh, airport committee, I would like to take my name off it. Okay. And uh, Miss Gillis said she'd go on it. Okay. If that's okay. Is everybody guess, fine with that? Fine with that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can go ahead and read okay, it. Okay, I'll read it now. Um, <coughs> Structure Committee, I'm Jay McKechn. Airport Committee, that Councillor Catherine Gillis and Councillor Chisholm participate in the I'm Jay McKechn Airport Committee. Seconder? I'll second it. Second by Deputy Warren McIsaac. That was moved by Councilor McClendon. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Uh, committee structure for Eastern District Planning Committee. Uh, I move that the Warden Cranton and Councilor Poirier participate in the Eastern District Planning Commission Committee. <coughs> I'll second that motion. Moved by Councilor Gillis, second by Councilor McClendon. Uh, that uh, are any any further discussion on the motion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Starting to get tongue tied here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Nine point one eight. Want to take that one? Sure. sure. Why not? Committee structure: Eastern Counties Regional Library Committee. That Councillor Coye. Uh, participate in the Eastern Counties Regional Library Committee. Seconder to that. Second. Second, to that. Second by Councilor McClendon, and that was moved by Deputy Warden McIsaac. Any further discussion? Question. All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Nine point two. I move uh, committee structure Bedour Lake uh, Biosphere uh, Reserve Committee. The Councillor McLannan uh, participate in the Bedour uh, Lake Biosphere uh, Reserve Committee. Second the motion. Any further discussion? Question. Question. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> You've got the mover and second. Okay. okay. 9.21. I move that Deputy Warden McIsaac participate in the Kimmon Partnership Re Regional Enterprise Network. Okay, seconder? I'll second. Okay. Second of like, that's moved by Councillor Poirier and seconded by Councillor Chisholm. Any further discussion? No question? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 9.21. I move that the committee structure for the Cape Breton Local Immigration Network, that Councillor Chisholm participate <coughs> in the Cape Breton Local Immigration Network. Second. So that's moved by Councillor Gillis, second by Deputy Warren Isaac. Any further discussion? Question, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Okay. I move committee structure, regional police advisory board, that Deputy Warden McIsaac and Councilor McClannan participate in the regional police advisory board. Moved by Councilor Gillis, second by Councilor Poirier. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, motion carried. 9.22, we're getting there. Okay, I'll take this one. Okay. I move that. Uh, oh, sorry. Can uh, Catherine do that one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm gonna, Move, I move oh. that the committee structure for straight area transit that Warden Cranton and Councillor McLennan participate in the straight area transit board. Okay, that was a change. Councillor Gillis was going to take that. Yeah, mm -hmm. they've done a switch there, so that's great. Any, any questions? There was a discussion? little discrepancy or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've explained to you some other day. <laughs> <laughs> any, anyway, um, so that's I have a Mover, seconder. Second. Oh, second. Oh, second by, by Councillor Poirier. Yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 
Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 9.24. I move uh, Committee Structure Municipal Housing Corporation, the, uh, the Deputy Warden McIsaac, Councilor Poria, Councilor Gillis, and Warden Cramp participate in the Municipal Housing Corporation Board. Second. Moved by Councilor Gillis, second by Councilor McClendon. Any further discussion? Question all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Getting there. Okay. I move that the community grant application Wicogama Child Development Center that council approved funding the Wicogama Child Development Center stackable washer and dryer for 50% of $1,075.22 out of district number 4 CDC budget. I'll That's second moved. that motion. Okay. It's moved by Deputy Warden McIsaac, second by Councillor McLennan. Any further discussion on the motion? Question? Mm -hmm. All in favor, aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Motion carried. 9.26. I move that the community grant application, Cranton Crossroads Community Center, the Council approve funding the community Cranton, the Cranton community, <laughs> Cranton. Crossroads Community <laughs> Center. Very good. Um, Cider Press. In the amount of two thousand dollars out of District Number Two's CDC budget. Seconder. Second. Moved by Councillor Gillis. Second by Councillor Poirier. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Okay. Two more to go. Nine point two seven. Uh -huh. Community grant application, Cape Babba Trails Committee. The council approved funding for the Cape Babba Trails Club opening up the past project in the amount of $2,357.50 out of the District 5 CDC budget. Moved by Councilor McClendon, seconder. I'll second. <coughs> Councilor Gillis, any further discussion? All in favor, aye. Mm -hmm. Opposed, motion carried. I move letter of support, a Glendale Area Community Cooperative, that a letter of support is issued to the Glendale, Glendale Area Community Cooperative with New Horizons Senior Pro Seniors Project. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. That was a long list. Well done. And well done, folks. We were <laughs> organized to the point. I thank staff for helping us get organized. Absolutely. They, they gave us good notes to follow. It wouldn't have happened as easily without that. So thank you, staff. Um, okay. We have, let's look at our next meeting date. It was the 7D. Are we There's an information session on the 15th. Tuesday the 15th. Um, at 9.30, just a series of updates to council. It's uh, now run for uh, approximately 2 o'clock. So it's an update for various organizations uh, that receive funding uh, or support from this panel. Uh, but the next regular scheduled uh, meeting, the whole meeting, is Thursday the 17th, and that's uh, for time of 9.30. Currently that will be planned to be held here in council chambers unless as we discussed the COVID situation <coughs> So we're looking at the 15th for that meeting and then we need to go on the 17th. So, so we have the two together? We have the two together? No. Long we have meetings. people coming in to report okay. that. Okay, any further discussion? That's at 9.30 okay. on the 15th? 9.30 the 15th and 9.30 on the 17th. Oh, yes. That's just a bit too much that week for me. It's okay. Okay, so we have our next meeting dates. And next items are in camera, so we'll have to ask. Yes, yeah, we can just go to a short recess. Yeah, we'll have a bit of a recess. So we should adjourn this meeting, I guess. Oh, oh. 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 come back. Okay.
Okay, a short recess. I'll just say a quick hello to everyone. So we thought that since there are a number of new folks uh, there, and congratulations, um, and uh, we know it's a, it's a very busy time right now as you're uh, going through all of the orientation and, and getting up to speed, but we thought we'd spend a little bit of time going through a short presentation just so that um, we get everybody kind of on a level playing field, so I apologize if some of you have seen it before. Um, and then we're happy to answer any questions you have um, anywhere, any all the way through and, and at the end. I, I imagine that mu much of the questions will get answered through this presentation, um, but uh, but happy to spend as much time as you'd like on the other end, and we can we can talk through that as well. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with Develop Nova Scotia, we are a crown corporation of the provincial government. Um, we used to go by Waterfront Development um, because that was our focus, uh, the Halifax and Lutherford water, uh, waterfronts as well as the property in the Cove and a couple of other projects that we were involved in, um, but very much focused on placemaking and also on economic development um, through um, uh, social infrastructure and through uh, public infrastructure. And um, um, our mandate was, uh, was expanded to be province-wide. Um, uh, same time as we were uh, we were given the uh, responsibility for the uh, rural internet file uh, that was in late in 2017 uh, 2018 um, and uh, actually I think it was early 2018 um, and at that time we we uh, rebranded to develop Nova Scotia and so some folks wonder why someone or why an organization that used to uh, manage waterfronts is now looking at uh, rolling out to rural internet but it, it really isn't all that different. Um, it is about what makes place uh, accessible um, and connected, um, just as the work that we do through placemaking. Um, it's crucial for economic growth and, uh, and for quality of life, uh, which uh, we would say that a lot of our, uh, our other work uh, is focused on as well. And certainly it's a very large, complex uh, infrastructure project, which we're very, very familiar with. So it's really not too far off the mark. Um, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, what we, how we went into it and, and the principles that we set up um, to go through it, and then I'll give you a sense of uh, where we're at right now. Um, so I uh, always start by talking a little bit about um, our approach uh, and uh, what that's based on. Um, so we set right from the beginning, um, we wanted to set uh, expectations at an appropriate, um, uh, appropriate level. Um, past programs had promised 100% coverage, and we know uh, based on um, our own uh, experience and uh, a lot of expertise and so on that it's, it's, it's almost impossible to get fully 100% of every home and business covered with, uh, with the internet. Uh, at some point you will run into a, a situation where there is a home or business that, business that is so far off the grid or has um, physical circumstances whereby it is absolutely unfeasible to try and reach it. Doesn't mean there won't be technologies coming along any day now that will help, but um, at this point, um, getting uh, getting a signal off a tower or fiber to the home, um, or even satellite in some cases, is uh, is next to, to uh, impossible to do that. So we set our objective um, to reach uh, at least and more than 95% of Nova Scotia homes and businesses. Um, we are we were very confident that we could get uh, beyond that, and we have always said that we will go as far as we can to get as close to 100% as we can. And uh, and even though at this point with the projects that we have underway, we've already met that 95, we are still working, and we will continue to work to get as close to 100% as we can because we know that we can go further. Um, we've also always been very focused on outcomes and not on the technology that's used. So we are focused on, on meeting the objectives that we set out um, for, the, for the initiative uh, in terms of speeds um, and the kinds of uh, evolution in the technology that we're looking for, the robust nature of the technology so that it can grow over time. All of those things were important, but the actual technology was not as, uh, as important to us. We wanted um, the uh, uh, internet service providers and, and municipalities and others who were responding, on, responding to us to have the leeway to say what, what they felt was the best technology in order to actually achieve the objectives that we set out. And we've been consistent in that all the way through. Um, we also set out um, minimum speeds, so minimum, minimum target speeds for our, uh, for our initiative. Um, and they are based on the minimum target speeds or target speeds that are set uh, nationally by the CRTC. Um, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, effort underway across Canada 
um, uh, by the CRTC, uh, by um, ISEV as well, through the uh, Universal Broadband Fund um, to, to address uh, the uh, rural broadband issue across Canada. And so they had set uh, minimum target speeds uh, at um, 50, 10, and 25, 5, and I'll explain what that is. So that's where we set ours as well um, to make sure that we were um, in lockstep uh, with uh, the federal government, uh, also given that um, if we needed to access some of that federal funding, that we would be uh, that we would be uh, working towards the same kind of objectives. So uh, the minimum speed uh, uh, is 50 megabits per second down, and 10 megabits per, per second up on a wired service. And when I say wired, what that what I mean by that is a fiber to the home or a coax cable right to the home. Um, it has to be a minimum of 50 uh, 10, and we know that most of those services are far in excess of 50 10. Um, uh, and it, uh, so, you know, not an issue, but that is the minimum that it has to deliver. Um, um, the other speed uh, target is uh, 25 megabits per second down and 5 megabits per second up on a wireless service. And now when I say wireless service, what I'm talking about is a signal off a tower. So the tower is being fed by fiber, and then there is a signal off a tower that goes to the home of the business, or satellite, so it comes from, uh, from satellite uh, down to the home of the business. Um, both those services must be a minimum of uh, 25.5, um, and that's just a beginning speed. We also um, um, require them to show us how they get from 25.5 to a 50.10, so that we can um, uh, level up the playing field so that we're all at at least that minimum speed, uh, and that minimum speed is deemed to be um, uh, the, the, the least amount that people should have um, on an ongoing basis in order to meet their uh, basic business and home needs. Um, so, uh, and I will uh, also point out that most of the projects uh, that we've approved to date um, provide uh, far in excess of those minimum speeds. Um, but we do not make recommendations uh, on projects that don't meet those speeds. Um, we've also, um, so we did a lot of consultation before we uh, did, uh, baked our uh, strategy around this uh, initiative. And we did, um, so we, we talked to a lot of people across Nova Scotia to find out about past programs and key stakeholders and what they were worried about and the kinds of things that, uh, that were concerning them. Uh, and we heard a lot about uh, accountability uh, on, the, on the side of the um, service providers. Uh, so the way in which we're, uh, that we've dealt with that is we did look across, uh, across Canada to see what others were doing. Um, and we took what was, what was working the best uh, across Canada and then we brought it back and we, and we further strengthened it uh, and, we, uh, and we used some uh, uh, telecommunications legal expertise to help us uh, um, formulate uh, some agreements that are pretty tight. So we have two different agreements. We sign a contribution agreement, which covers basically the, uh, the installation, the design, engineering, installation of the actual network. Uh, and then we sign a service level agreement, and it's a 10-year agreement uh, with a service provider. And that covers uh, the service uh, and the quality and the, that, they're, that they're actually delivering what they say they're going to deliver in the proposals. So when I say, um, so they are monitored, we monitor them on an ongoing basis, and we will um, for, for 10 years. Um, and um, what we will be monitoring are a number of different things. So certainly that they're delivering the speeds that they say they're gonna deliver. So if their proposal says we're gonna deliver 100, um, uh, then we will measure that they're delivering 100. And we won't measure at 3 o'clock in, uh, in the morning, we'll measure at busy time, which by national uh, research uh, is shown to be between 7.30 and 11. At night, which is when most people are on doing homework, uh, uh, streaming um, services, accessing um, government services, uh, doing homework, doing research, that kind of stuff, um, working. So and we will test them on an ongoing basis to ensure that they're delivering what they should, uh, what they say they're delivering. We'll also test other things like um, jitter and packet loss, which can impact um, uh, services like Zoom and, and uh, Teams and things like that, where you get uh, breaks in signals. Um, we will also test things like uh, downtime, so network uh, for the down, uh, network downtime. So if there's something happens to the network um, and it goes down, which sometimes does happen, we'll be looking at how long does it take uh, to get the network back up and running. Um, you know, what was the time frame involved in that, and so on. So there are all a number of things that we will monitor uh, on an ongoing basis. So that's a little bit about um, the basics around our approach. Um, I'll talk a little bit about providers first, but I do want to be uh, specific as well, just to go back a bit to say that in 2018, when we were, uh, just before we were given the um, mandate to take this uh, initiative on, 
Um, the province put aside $193 million into an independent um, arms length uh, funding trust uh, called the Nova Scotia Internet Funding Trust. Um, uh, it is run arms length from uh, the government. Um, there are three people, uh, and a chair, and two other people who run that trust. Uh, they hold the money, they manage the money, they make the decisions on the, uh, on the projects. We do not hold that money, nor do we make the decisions. Um, our job is to um, develop the strategy, uh, develop the competitive process, run the competitive process, do the due diligence, um, take a look at the proposals, ensure that they're uh, meeting guidelines, score them, evaluate them, and then make recommendations to the trust in order for projects to be approved and funded. Once that happens, um, that then comes back to us and we actually monitor it during um, installation, design, engineering, and installation, and then uh, through service level agreements in terms of uh, delivered quality of service. So just um, from, a, from a process perspective, I wanted to be clear about, about where that money sits. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what, what's been spent and what's left in that trust a, a little bit later. So in our, um, in our process, we, we pre-qualified providers. We had two calls um, looking for qualified providers, um, one before our first RFP and then one just after our uh, first RFP and, and before our second RFP. Um, so these are all the um, uh, organizations that have been pre-qualified with us. As you'll see, there's lots of different organizations there. They're big, they're small, um, they're local, um, they're national. Um, there's some that involve uh, municipalities, some are consortiums, uh, some are uh, municipally led and owned, um, uh, and so there's a whole different uh, uh, range of organizations that have been pre-qualified. But all of them met the criteria that we set out, which was they had to have experience in designing, building, maintaining, and, um, and evolving a network over time. Uh, they had to have the financial capacity to do this kind of a project, and they had to have the human resources in order to actually make this project work. So those were the those were the things that we tested, um, and all of these folks are pretty qualified uh, to respond to any and all of our RFPs at this point. <clears throat> so I'll give you a, a sense of where we started. Uh, so in May of 2019, when we issued our first RFP, so our first request for proposals, which went out to about 10 of those uh, providers who were qualified at the time, we asked them to, uh, um, we, broke, we broke the province down into a number of zones, um, and we asked them to uh, provide us uh, projects and, and um, uh, pitch projects to us for any of the zones, any portion of the zones, uh, whole zones, and, and multiple zones, wherever they wanted to actually uh, do a project. All we wanted them to do was to be able to pitch us a project that would be able to be completed in six to 12 months. Um, and the reason why we did that is because we wanted, we knew the need was urgent and we wanted to get stuff moving quickly. And in order to do that, uh, we needed to get some of the, the projects that were a little more ready to move forward, get those in, get them evaluated and get them going, um, while we took a little bit more time to get some of the uh, um, more complex projects uh, underway. So, um, uh, so uh, at that point, um, according to, um, uh, I said data, CRTC data, we would have been around 70% um, uh, covered. So 70% of the uh, social homes and businesses had high speed internet at the speeds, that, at the minimum speeds that we had set, so um, minimum quality. So you'll see on this, this is a progress map, uh, you'll see the areas with purple were the areas that had rural internet or um, you know, sufficient internet to, uh, to uh, provide folks with the kind of service. Um, uh, that was required. Um, all the areas in white are those areas that required um, a high-speed internet, and the areas in green are areas of uh, very, very low to no uh, demand. Um, and so uh, there are, you can see there are little bits of white in there. We knew where you know some of those clusters of homes and businesses are, but for the most part, in the middle of Kajimakujik or the middle of the uh, wilderness protection area, there is no demand for internet. That's different than demand for cell. Um, but, it's, but, but from an internet perspective, there's very little demand. And so those, those uh, were taken off the, off the table in terms of trying to provide coverage in those areas focused on where there were premises, homes and businesses, or household units, as we like to say. So that's where we were when we issued our first RFP. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of a, um, a process here, or a little um, chart that shows you the progress to date. So as you'll see, um, the first uh, round of projects was announced um, uh, earlier this year. It is still 2020, oh hard to believe. Um, and so round one projects were announced in February. <clears throat> and in those projects, um, there were five different service providers, uh, large ones and small ones that got projects, um, covered about 42,000 homes and businesses. 
this is across Nova Scotia, um, in, in all kinds of different areas of Nova Scotia. Um, so those got us uh, started right away. Um, within days, we, we launched RFP number two, um, and uh, um, and th that was what we asked was all the areas that didn't have projects. That was what we what we put out for uh, for a request for proposals. We wanted proposals back from all of the pre-qualified uh, providers as to where they could provide projects to uh, to extend coverage. Um, uh, you will also remember that in March, of course, COVID hit, and there was uh, additional um, monies that were put aside uh, by the province to accelerate uh, the projects that were underway already to see if there was any capacity to make those move faster. Uh, and so we were able to spend about 5.6 million of that uh, with a number of our providers. Uh, and we were able to, uh, through um, that, is, uh, that acceleration, um, we were able to complete uh, the network install for um, about 18,000 homes and businesses by the end of August, which is about six months earlier than we, than we anticipated. Um, so we got those um, moving as quickly as possible and all the other round one projects continue. Um, September 1st, we announced round two projects. Uh, so that was to our second uh, RFP. Um, and all of those happened to, to go to Bell, um, uh, just based on the scoring and the evaluation of the proposals. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, covering 32,000 homes and businesses across Nova Scotia. Um, so again, those projects are now all underway as well. Um, in, uh, so once we had done that, we knew now what areas were left um, to be covered. And so again, we started looking at, um, okay, so how do we get the next, um, uh, the next group, uh, uh, the, the, as many of the remaining homes and businesses covered as we can. So the first uh, step we took was to, to extend our current contracts. Um, um, so from a procurement perspective, um, you know, you usually look to your current contracts to see whether those can be extended to uh, achieve your objectives. So we looked at those and we, uh, and we asked all of the folks that have uh, current contracts with us, can you extend the geog geographic scope of your current contract to cover off more of these folks that are unserved? Um, and so we just announced the first round of that um, on November 23rd and we were able to capture another uh, 6,700 uh, homes and businesses, many of which were in um, and uh, as well, just as an update, by November 23rd, uh, just a revised to date uh, network install is complete for about 21 to 22,000 um, businesses at this point. And the providers are just are hooking people up as quickly as they can on those, and they continue to, to extend the networks in all the other areas as well. Um, we anticipate that um, in December or January, we'll have another a contract extension announcement. Um, there are still um, uh, proposals that are anticipated in zones one, three, and four, um, and I can talk a little bit about those uh, again. But it's uh, I think it's uh, Annapolis and uh, South Shore, and there's one other area where we're oh the Western zone so where we're expecting a few more um, uh, proposals. So there, there there will likely be a further number that will be uh, covered through those contract extensions, um, and in the other areas where we have pockets of homes and businesses that remain uncovered and we have no other current uh, contracts underway in those areas that can be extended any further, then what we're doing is we're going direct to the service providers, all of them that, are, uh, that, are, that were listed on that last slide, and we're saying, okay, there's a group of 10 homes, how are we gonna cover those? What, what would it take to cover these? What, what, what would you suggest um, in terms of uh, what would be required from the monetary perspective? What do you suggest as the as best technology to try and reach these homes and businesses? We, had, we anticipate and, um, and uh, uh, estimate that there are between six and 7,000 homes remaining all across Nova Scotia that's, uh, that still um, need coverage. So the total number of homes and businesses that have been addressed um, by the projects that are underway now are around 80,000 or a little, little under 81,000 um, are underway. Um, so this, this was September when we announced um, our second round of projects, was, which got us to 97%. If you include the two independent projects that are underway in Picto and, uh, um, and Annapolis County. So those are the darker uh, purple, but you can see that there's a lot more purple on the map. There still exists those, those uh, white areas. Those were the ones that we tried to cover off in contract extensions. And we'll see that once we did contract extensions, um, now we're up to about 97.5 percent, and you can see a lot of those uh, white areas to turn to purple, which was what we were trying to do um, to cover those off. So these, so those remaining small little bits of white um, are where we have those six to seven thousand um, homes and businesses that we estimate to be uh, without coverage, and that's what we're trying to solve right now. 
talk a little bit about the timeline, give you a sense of where we are on that. Um, so um, again, in May of 2019, which was when we issued our first RFP, we, we were at about 70%. Um, by August 2020, um, we had uh, we had um, connected uh, around 18,000 of those, uh, so we're at 78. Um, we anticipate that all the first round projects will be done uh, complete, potentially complete by uh, the end of March 2021 or before, um, and so that'll take us to 88 um, percent. The round two projects, which are front end loaded, a lot of the design engineering work that goes in the front end as well as make grade work um, um, before crews are ever seen in the community uh, doing installations, but we expect that those projects were, will start um, uh, coming on board and, and being completed um, around summer 2021, so next summer, around 10 or 11,000 um, of those. Uh, by the end of 2021, another 10,000, and then all 32,000 of those that was second round will be complete uh, summer 2022. Um, and our scope expansion to projects um, uh, may take us out to the fall of 2023. Um, but again, we'll be looking for the, the uh, service providers are going to go back and take a look at where they've got work underway, what makes sense to, you know, in terms of uh, timing and so on. So we expect that uh, many of those might be done in advance of that uh, fall 2023. And again, we're not done. So we don't know where we're going to end, but we know we can get, uh, we, can get we can do better than 70, 97.5. More of that, of that we can get. So our work continues. Um, I told you I was gonna tell you a little bit about the uh, funding trust. So again, there was 193 million in it when we started. Um, very early on, there were a few early federal Connect to Innovate uh, projects that had been announced in 2016, 2017, that I identified uh, provincial money, so it made sense for, for that money to come out of the trust. Uh, all of those projects had been pre-validated uh, pre from a federal perspective. We took another look at them to make sure that they met our criteria, uh, and then we approved funding uh, of about 500,000 um, that went to those projects. They were mostly what we call middle mile projects, uh, so the putting in the backbone network, not very many of them actually involved um, connections to the home or business. Uh, phase one, which was September, um, we uh, committed $51 million was, uh, came from the trust for those projects, and that also includes the $5.6 million of acceleration funding to move those faster. Um, the phase two projects, which were announced in um, September, that, uh, there was a commitment of 60 million from the trust. Uh, the most recent scope expansions in November, um, that took another 24 million. So remaining in the trust is 58 million dollars. That is that is the those that's the dollars. Those are the, that's the money that we're using to further extend coverage as far as we can. Uh, important to note as well that through that we've leveraged funding. Um, so 18 million of that was other public, public sector investment, mostly municipalities who happen to have money set aside uh, to contribute to those projects. Um, and then 111 million dollars from the private sector. So every one of the ISPs for the internet service providers that we sign deals with are also investing heavily in the projects um, as we go. Uh, a couple of points just in terms of um, comparisons, just to understand where we sit across Canada. Um, so according to CRTC data, uh, we, if, if we take out the urban areas, which are generally well serviced because they're denser uh, in population, um, Nova Scotia ranks about fourth in Canada for access to coverage in rural communities at that 5 to 10 minimum uh, target speed, um, which is not bad, um, but we think we can do a lot better. Um, we do believe, uh, based on what we know about where everybody else sits within their own processes, that at the completion of the bills that we have underway, uh, Nova Scotia will, will lead the country in terms of percentage uh, coverage of, uh, for uh, uh, internet coverage across Nova Scotia. I don't suspect we'll be there for long. Um, everyone else is trying to crack the same nut, so um, we might get there first, but I don't think we'll, we'll be there long. Um, also important to note is that um, uh, we are moving uh, on average 50% faster on most steps of the project uh, implementation when compared to industry norms. The reason why I raise that is because it, trying to make things move faster is not always about money. Um, you know, we saw that. We had $15 million to spend on acceleration. We ended up being able to spend uh, 5.6. Um, because at some, some point in time, and considering some of the size of some of these companies, there, there is no capacity to go any faster than they're going. They're already going. Our timelines are very, very aggressive. We're pushing really hard. Um, and uh, we've been told that many, many times. Um, uh, and so at a certain point, you can't really go any faster. Um, there's a, you know, there's a, a capacity issue. So where are we in Inverness County? So 
So after the scope expansions that we just announced on the 23rd, which um, um, we uh, have a, a far end date of fall 2023, but anticipate that many of those projects might, might get done before that. Um, all of the projects uh, in, uh, in, your, in your county and in your area are Bill Canada projects, um, so they're all fiber of the home. So speeds well in excess of, of 5010. Um, and some of you can see some of the communities that we uh, that we covered off um, through this uh, this most recent announcement. So a lot of those uh, areas where people were were concerned that they were going to be left behind, and, uh, and um, we're trying not to do that. Uh, and so now what? Uh, we're going to finish the job. Um, we're not done. We, um, uh, we we think that it's around six to seven. Um, says eight here, but 67,000 uh, remaining homes and businesses across uh, Nova Scotia that remain uncovered. 300 of those are in Cape Breton, and the vast, vast majority of those are in CBRM. And so uh, there are very, very, very few household units in, uh, in, the, in the region that um, are not covered off by projects, according to our data. Um, we, we are going to continue to work with internet service providers on more scope expansions in a couple of other areas, um, and we're also going to start to reach out directly to service providers to identify projects for areas that are left uncovered, um, and then we'll look to uh, new technologies coming on board as well for solutions um, in the longer term <coughs> for those that were under, unable to reach with technologies that we have now. So a few of the common questions that we get from the public. Um, uh, we uh, often get questions around the most recent announcement, um, so either scope expansion or, or round two projects, um, you know, is my home or business included? Um, and so in many cases, it is not that we are hiding that information. We don't have that uh, street and address level information detail at this point. Um, when, uh, when the service providers bid on the project, uh, they, they make certain assumptions about where that, those routes are going to go. Then once the award, that is awarded, um, then they go in and they refine that um, uh, and do more detailed design work, engineering work, uh, and that's when they start to look at um, are, are there barriers in those routes that we anticipated, that we didn't anticipate, uh, those kind of things. So all of those routes have to be um, uh, designed, engineered, and then approved. And once those coverage maps are provided to us uh, by the service provider, we will post them to our website and I'll show you where in a, a little bit uh, later on in this presentation. Um, but um, and, and also, as soon as we get estimated completion dates, we will, we will post those as well. And so they'll start to narrow down. The next round, likely, uh, we're supposed to get milestone information from the service providers. Um, we'll probably be able to narrow it down to maybe a few months and then a year, so that you'll have a better sense of when we think that one, that uh, particular community will come on board. Always subject to change, you know, based on a whole bunch of different things. Um, but we can narrow it down a little bit further, and then when coverage maps uh, get uh, posted, we can usually narrow it down a little bit further than that as well. Um, lots of questions from folks um, that say there's a new project for my area, what now? Um, and our, 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 our message really is we're not done. Um, we're continuing to work. We think we can get further, and that's what we're trying to do right now. We've got lots of different avenues open to us, and we're going to work them until we try and get as close to 100%. Um, as we can, we um, predominantly we know where all the remaining pockets are, um, and uh, and um, you know we're we're working to try to figure out how to how the best way to cover those uh, those folks are. Um, we also, um, in some cases, the community names that have been provided to us um, aren't um, as robust as they could be, um, and we always invite people to fill out um, the uh, form that's available on our website. Um, provide us their address. We'll check to see if their community is 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 actually is included in it. Um, then we'll try to kind of update that on our website so that it actually in, um, indicates that their community is covered off. We hear a lot about price um, uh, and affordability, um, and, and making sure that um, uh, that that rural um, uh, Nova Scotians are paying the same kind of uh, prices that urban Nova Scotians are. Um, and that was a big concern for us too when we heard that when we were talking to folks. Um, we are managing price uh, through our service level agreements. And so what we've done is we've said comparable services must be comparable prices no matter where they're offered. So if I in Halifax have fiber in the home and you in Craignish have fiber in the home and I don't have any extra bells and whistles and neither do you, we should be paying the same price. That is the tenant. Uh, in our service level agreement, and we will manage that over time. So we will do an annual audit, but we will also monitor them on an ongoing basis. 
Uh, we also receive questions around whether um, our rural areas will receive inferior services. Um, and, and, you know, our answer to that is we have minimum standards. We will not uh, recommend projects uh, that don't meet our minimum standards to the trust for approval and funding. And so, um, uh, you know, the, no matter where folks uh, live, the, the service, uh, if there's a service approved to be installed in their area, it has to at least um, deliver the minimum speed targets that we set. Uh, we also hear a lot about low low income <coughs> affordability, and we know that this uh, is an issue we've heard um, from uh, from folks about this as well. Um, there's you know uh, uh, Manek, who some of you may know on our team, who leads this, this initiative for us, would say that you know um, internet access um, is is kind of a, 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 a stool with three legs. Um, access is one of the legs. So if you, if you live somewhere and you can't access the service that will provide minimum speeds or you can't access any service whatsoever because there's none available, that's one leg of the stool. That's what we're focused on. Our, our job is to try and get access out to as, uh, uh, as many Nova Scotia uh, Scotians as we can. The other two uh, legs of that stool though are skills and abilities and also affordability. And so those two legs of the stool are being looked at by, um, by a number of different departments within government right now. Um, looking at the digital divide, making sure that um, there are uh, programs around skills development, technology provision, um, and, and trying to figure out where the you know where they can um, contribute in order to actually address some of those affordability issues. So that work is actively underway. Um, this is uh, uh, screenshot of our website, which we've changed uh, dr uh, pretty dramatically between uh, round one and round two, but we actually created a microsite um, that's a little easier to uh, to navigate, uh, and we're looking at how to make it na more navigatable, oh my god, that's a word, um, off our front page as well, uh, so some of those changes are everywhere as well, but you can get directly to uh, this uh, this site um, by uh, uh, through internet.develop.ns.ca, um, and that search bar right at the top, um, if you put your community, or if one of your constituents puts their community in there, and there's a project underway in their, in their community, it will pop up and, and provide whatever detail we have. And so here's one where I you know, I, I mentioned um, the coverage maps and the SPA completion date, and you can see here, um, you know, in this area, we have, this is a round one project, um, which should be done next month. Um, it's Bell Canada, it's Fiber the Home, which is a technology, it's underway, anticipated completion is December 2020, and then there are a number of different coverage maps that show where that uh, service is being extended. That is the kind of information you can expect once we have it from the service uh, providers. We will post it to our site, um, and we also it also often gets shared with the municipalities as well, and some of those folks are, are sharing that on their websites as well, which is great. Um, and just before I end and, and uh, open it up for questions and discussion, um, uh, uh, our, um, uh, we are very diligent about, uh, about responding to all of the inquiries we get, and we get quite a few. Um, we have a web, uh, website, obviously, and it has a form that can be filled out. Um, uh, we have an um, a, a email address, info at developns.ca, and we have a 1-800 number because we recognize not everyone has access. Um, all of those inquiries are answered, um, and sometimes if volumes high, it takes us a little bit longer, but they all will be answered um, as soon as we can get to them, um, so that people have as much information um, as they need. So I'm going to stop talking and see if there's questions I can answer, or if folks have specific concerns or Thank you, Deborah. I'll turn it over to the, our warden, Lori Cran, and you'll... Uh, to work around the room. <coughs> you, may not be, you may not be able to hear, but uh, if, if so, I'll reiterate the question. Can you hear me from over here? Hello, can you hear that? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you're faint, but I can hear something. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna go around the room here. But before I do, I just have a quick question. Are you able to go back to the slide where you said what's happening in Inverness County? Yeah, I'm having a hard time right. hearing you. Yeah. I'll do, I'll just, I'll just okay. reiterate. So just go back to the slide where you list what's happening in Inverness County. Yep, sure.
Right here? Yes. Um, I see Mikova's in there, um, and maybe I'm missing it, but I don't see anything for the Marguerite's in there. And that's a huge area. Mikova's a beautiful place, but uh, very small population, but yet we have a big area in the Marguerite's that's not listed on there. I'm just wondering why it's not there. Marguerite? Yeah. Is so, what I heard? Yeah, okay. so uh, if you may want to review what portions of Marguerite are covered under phase one, or sorry, so, phase so, two, first so, round. So if you, um, if you want to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to actually bring up our website. Just hold on a sec. <sighs> <clears throat> and then we will find out because our website knows all now. Would <clears throat> you get your name up there, John? John, I need your picture. Yeah. <laughs> John the Technology. Yeah. 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 Your name yeah. isn't up there. It's <laughs> primary in the back room. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You see our our yeah. website now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's how you get to the internet for Nova Scotia. Well, here, let me just do this. Why don't I go to the zone now? That makes more sense. So here we go. So this will, if you go into that and click on uh, your zone in, in uh, Cape Breton, you will see all of the uh, um, per projects that are currently underway and approved in that area. And I'm just going to keep going until I find something that doesn't matter to the class. And if not, we can do some. Uh, Let's go back. Uh, we can do some looking to see going? alphabetical what's order. There. Yeah. There's Marguerite Forks. There we go. What's the harbor? I'm not saying what So this would have been a round two project, I believe, that was announced. Uh, includes Marguerite Forks, Marguerite Center, Marguerite Valley, Northeast Marguerite, Portree, King Ross, Vivillet, and Emerald. Okay. And, then and again. Scroll down to Marguerite Harbor as well. Pardon me? Scroll down to Marguerite Harbor. Yep. And there's that one. And in Marguerite Harbor, that includes? Belcote, Marguerite, Jimmy Corner, St. Rose. Okay. Right. Good. Thank you very much. And that that information will get more granular when we get our uh, when we get our uh, coverage maps, which are underway right now. It can take two, four, six months in some cases for those to get to get done. I mean, they have like that was got now. Well, the recent ones, they've got about 130 projects going for us across Nova Scotia. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Gillis. Um, so, under the expansion of phase two, I think that's where you were mistaken, but uh, I have listed, uh, Glendale is listed, but they cover it like the little Princeville, Queensville, um, those areas are asking me, you know, they're not specifically listed under that expansion but i don't i'm wondering if they are covered so councillor gillis with district six her, her mm -hmm. area includes the glendale area and there's uh -huh. some smaller areas in and around uh, glendale such as uh, queensville etc i think uh, your cao uh, jeff rangel has received some emails asking for more and more specifics um you're probably still not able to drill down into that yet or is there more detail is uh, yeah around? no that's a so that was just announced on november 23rd yeah so this one glendale it's yes. a scope expansion yes um so that one we we won't have more detailed information um on that uh for a number of months until we can get some coverage maps um, if there is a specific location, so if there's a specific business or a specific home um, that people are, are wondering about, um, they can uh, they can identify that um, on the on the form, and I'll just 
I'll show you where the form is. See this, have a question, need more information, get in touch with us. Um, we ask for their residence address. Um, and, oh, this is the, is that one? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, we ask their residence address. And then um, we will actually check to see what we can find out uh, and whether we can um, we can kind of further refine it and uh, from a community name perspective, um, we will try to do that. Um, but there is a certain level of specificity that we have to wait for uh, until the um, detailed design and engineering work is done. But again, our estimates tell us that there's like very, very, very few household units left. Uh, in your areas to be covered. Chisholm, anything? Um, I don't have any questions. Just just comment. Um, um, I've had a few people in my district in the last week actually message me, and it was quite simple to get back to Braden. It was actually Braden who returned a quick message, like in minutes, um, about, for example, Northeast Mobile was a question, and it, it's, it's really good to get those quick answers. Um, and I do like the internet dot development not development no scotia dot ca um, where we can go in there and browse the community and, and get answers also. So that's always good to send out to our constituents. Are you able to hear that, Deborah? No. No. Okay, so <laughs> Councillor uh, Chisholm, who's from uh, Representatives District uh, Five, uh, she was just providing some feedback as to the. Uh, uh, just some positive reaction to the your actual, your website, and that there's been some quick responses in terms of some of those questions about communities and around um, the announced areas that are close to those but may not have been listed, uh, and she's been able to get some feedback on those. Absolutely, yep. Um, if they want to, then and they can identify the community name as well, and then put their address in. And we'll uh, we'll add those if the, if it's really clear when we take a look at the the preliminary information we have that it is absolutely kind of in the middle or the center. Um, we'll add those community names in too uh, uh, to our website so that people know that um, there's there's coverage coming to their areas. The only time that we might hesitate is if it's on the very edge of what is being put together. We might wait until Bell comes back to us to say, you know, at, you know, where where is the end point uh, on the. Um, on the actual map uh, and the extension, but um, but mo for the most part, we can uh, we can figure that out based on preliminary data. Okay, Councillor McLennan. No, really, I get no questions. I seen uh, when you're scrolling through Inverness County, I seen what I wanted to see in uh, the Wakagaman area, River Dennis and Loose Mills, of course. I seen down through the lake. So no, you're doing fine. Thank you very much. Councilor McLennan, uh, District 4, said that uh, just scrolling through the information on the website, he's been able to determine the various areas in, uh, uh, his, in his district. So he's uh, pleased with that. Great. Councilor Poirier. Yeah, Poirier here, Pleasant Bay. Is it there yeah. somewhere? So Council, oh, I didn't hear you. Council Poirier's Wondering, he's with District 1, Shady Camp North, Jameen Cole, just wondering if uh, Pleasant Bay has been included in the Phase 2 or Phase 2 extension. <coughs> yep, Pleasant Bay. Yeah, that looks like a round 2. Pleasant Bay and Red River. So again, we should be getting more information on that very soon uh, in terms of uh, maps, coverage maps and stuff. So but, once they're done, they'll, they'll appear right under this. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Okay, Deputy Warren McIsaac. I've been following the updates being provided to us, and I'm fine. Thank you. Any questions I had, they were answered back in November. Deputy Warren McIsaac, District uh, 3, just stating that she's been able to gain uh, information from the updates regarding the various uh, new new locations and where things are at phase one and phase two. I have a I have a question here, CAO. When will we have the the uh, fiber maps? What when can we expect those? 
So uh, an additional question is when uh, do you expect the fiber maps for phase two and phase two expansion? So those were, so phase two were announced in September um, and so September 1st. You know, they can take anywhere from two to four, sometimes six months. So we're, we're kind of, you know, we're creeping into the middle of that range. I would expect that we'll start to, to receive some uh, soon. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, it could be two to six months before we see all of them. Uh, and then again, if you take the November announcement of the contract ex uh, extensions, you know, we'll, we'll probably lead into uh, early next year before we start to see maps on those as well. Anybody else got anything else? None um, for me. Just on behalf of myself as warden, um, thank you very much for providing this valuable information. And uh, we'll probably do it again sometime before we're all done with this. So the warden just reiterated uh, to say thank you for the valuable information. And uh, council would like to have you come back with an update as things proceed. We're happy to come back at any point that you would like us to, um, to, to provide an update. Um, anytime, you know how to get in touch with us. Um, and uh, we'll come back anytime. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Deborah and Ian and uh, Grace. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We still have one more we meeting do. yet. We have to go back in <laughs> camera, right? We have to go back in camera for one more item. Okay. I apologize for that, but I'm glad we came out and got yeah. through this. And this item shouldn't take too long. I'll move that we go back in camera. You can write to us at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.